Hello, everyone. I'm Uriah Kaiser, and I'm the publisher of Potomac Local News. We're just outside Washington, D.C. in Northern Virginia, and I've been doing this for 14 years. And, you know, I've always wanted to have a podcast where I talk to other local independent online news publishers and, and talk about what's working, talk about what their challenges are, and mainly talk about how you've overcome obstacles to make your business the success that it is. And that's why I'm so happy to have Howard Owens from The Batavian, who has agreed to come on and talk to me about a few of those things. And I'm honored that it's Howard because he is one of the pioneers in this business. If you are familiar with the Batavian, uh, then you already know that it is one of the first hyperlocal indies in the, in the US. Uh, and it is a reflection of the community in upstate New York that it serves. Howard talked to me about revenue, about advertising, about news coverage. Howard even touched on the loss of his wife and how that affected his business. It was an open conversation, one that I was pri privileged to, to be a part of. Uh, you know, I remember going to Lion, the local independent online news conferences back in, in, in 2017, 2018, and, and hearing Howard talk about how he started the business and how he went and talked to every business owner in town to talk about what the Batavian was and what its mission is. And that inspired me to want to have this conversation and share it with you. So let's get into it and listen to Howard talk about the Batavian. You know, given given the history of the site, given what you've tried, I mean, I I think I met you when you were doing the 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 the, the local day of the the sort of um, like a sale type of thing. Deal of what, the day. Deal of the day. Yeah, yeah we still do was, that. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that you've been through several, several iterations of, of you know, all of this stuff. Um, but I, I think what I want to ask you first about is, you know, your site doesn't conform to what some or most publishers think is a nice, clean news website. You have ads all over your site. And I think that's by design. And I just wanted to hear from you, what what's the thinking behind plastering your website full of ads? Uh, so, you know, I've been doing online publishing since 1995. I had first a web development job and then eventually became director of uh, the uh, online operation for the Ventura County Star um, back in the late 90s, early 2000s. And as web developer, I, you know, was a, a team effort with scripts, but uh, I basically pushed this idea of what I call the limited inventory model. Like we could get more at more CPM if we had only a few ad spaces. And that, at the time that wasn't kind of the norm. Everybody was doing a lot, you know, a lot of ads on the page. I'm like, let's limit them. Let's, let's put things in rotation and let's, uh, you know, then we can charge more CPM. And I found I uh, once I became director, I'm going out on sales calls with uh, our ad reps, meeting with small business owners, and it was very hard to get them to understand uh, what rotation was. It was just not a concept that they got. It was too uh, too complicated for them. And so uh, that was kind of a first clue. Then uh, when I was at Gatehouse Media. The, I became aware of a news site up in Watertown called News Junkie. And uh, a blogger had done uh, a piece about how they were basically kicking the ass of the local newspaper. The local newspaper was behind a paywall. Uh, it, you know, it had more limited news. This site was more uh, Drudge Report-like, except he had like 50 or 60 advertisers on his homepage. And basically, the blogger saying, "No, he's he's outselling them in ads. He's been at it years. He's having tremendous success. He has a much larger audience than any other media outlet in the region." And so, uh, my wife and I took a trip to Watertown. This is in New York. We're living in New York, 
And I went around and surveyed business owners and everybody loved News Janky. They said people are addicted to it. The ads work for them. They're very happy with the ad model. Then Gatehouse became uh, involved in a lawsuit with uh, the New York Times over the New York Times aggregating uh, content and uh, uh, and putting it on their own uh, hyper local sites in the New, Eng New England area. And part of preparing for that um, for that lawsuit, I went, you know, I had access to uh, the uh, statistics for 100 daily newspapers. I went through every one of them and looked at click paths. And repeatedly, people were not clicking on links. You'd get 50, 60% of the traffic, sometimes 80% of the traffic going to the homepage and leaving. If they clicked on any link, it would be for obituaries, possibly sports, possibly opinion. Uh, basically the entire top 10 of the most clicked on links never included a story link. So, uh, so anyway, so I had the opportunity to, to look at all these click paths and there are no story links at the top, you know, in the top 10. And I realized people don't like to click on links. And I remembered a, uh, having read a book by John Patel called The Search about the history of Google. And he talked about the database of attention, intentions. And that made me realize the web is uh, intention driven. People go to a web page with a specific intention. And I deduced that the reason somebody goes to a news, the homepage of a news website is they want to know what's happened since my last visit, what's new. And uh, that's where like the blog format just made a lot of sense. So I'm looking at, they want what's new at the top of the page. They don't care about our editorial decisions about what the top news story is. They just want to know what's new since they last visited. Uh, they don't want to click on links, so you better give them the whole story right on the page. And they don't want to click on links for advertisers. And, uh, you know, maybe the homepage should be more like a shopper and um, have be more like a business local business directory and just have all the local ads. And I call this like we talk about hyper local news to me. This is a hyper local uh, ad model. It's put all the all your local advertisers right on the homepage. So they're easy for people to see and find. So it seems to me that that it's also an easy sell. Because if an ad, if you sell an ad and the advertiser says, okay, I'll bite, I'll give you a hundred bucks, 150, whatever it is that you're charging, you throw something, you know, and they go to your website and they don't see their ad and you, you, then you have to school them on, well, what is CPM? What is shuffling? What is, I mean, it, you know, if I'm a customer and I, I and I pay for something, I, I kind of want to see it, use it, touch it, feel it, hold it, put it in action. and from the looks of your model, I don't think an advertiser would have a problem finding their ad. That's, that's it exactly. And and I want to bring into, you know, I have some small business experience. My dad was a small business owner. Uh, I used to co-own a small newspaper in San Diego County and I was the one that sold the ads. Um, uh, I've been a small business owner. So I understand the mindset. You're concentrating on running your business. And this is why I always argued, say, Google AdWords. And now I think even Facebook is not a huge threat with small business owners for local news sites because people, the small business owners are so busy, they don't want to take time to understand it. They want something simple and easy. They get the shopper, they get the penny saver. So that's really the model I pursued is give them uh, that easy buy. We don't have to explain ad rotation. We don't have to, it's a flat rate, so we don't have to explain CPM. Just make it simple. Sell yourself. Sell your. Uh, first of all, you know, as a small business owner, you're really kind of selling yourself even more than the site. And um, the by putting everything on the homepage, uh, also they look and they see their friends already advertising there. They see their competitors already advertising there. So it becomes a much easier sell. So talk about the selling yourself because i remember many years ago when we were in chicago at lion you you talking about how when you opened up the batavian you went around uh to all the different business owners to introduce yourself and talk about the site and you know sort of sell them on your vision uh and and so if someone is is you know who's an experienced publisher who's looking at their website and saying well i would really like to get some more advertisers or if there's someone just coming into the the business and saying how, how do I sell my first ad? How did you do it? 
Well, one of the big breakthroughs came, I tried a long time to get uh, an appointment with a, a local business owner, a small a restaurant owner, a pizzeria actually. And we met and, you know, I got my media kit. I'm laying out things for him. You know, this is what we have to offer. This is our audience, you know, the standard type of metrics. And his eyes were glazing over. And I said, and I don't know why this like occurred to me, but I just said, have I told you the history of the Batavian? He goes, no. And I said, well, uh, I'm going to, I won't go through the whole history now, but you know, how it started, how my wife and I sold our house in Pittsburgh and moved to Batavia. And now we're rooted here. We're committed to supporting small businesses. We're small business owners ourselves. He became engaged and he bought, you know, and I, and that became part of my standard pitch. We're small business owners, just like you, here's our story. And uh, that resonates with other small business owners. It's amazing how journalists focus so much on telling other people's stories. And yet when it comes to telling their own, they're afraid to do it. They don't do it. They overlook it. it they almost like uh, I, it's almost like a, a missed opportunity. Well, well, that brings up another good point. I hear from in, uh, in the uh, journalism subreddit that this has come up. But but for years, uh, when I was out talking to more journalists, I'd hear this thing. You know, I'm a reporter, not a salesman. And I'm like, no, you're a salesman. You get sources to talk to you. The only way you talk, they talk to you is because you sell yourself. And that's all you're doing here. It's just negotiation. It's persuasion. You have to do the same thing as uh, as a journalist. You know how to do this. When and and you you got your your, your first deal. I think you said it was with the, with the pizzeria, and you implemented. Did that you, wasn't the first deal, but that was a breakthrough deal. Let's say the breakthrough deal. And so at that point, did you just go around town and introduce yourself and and sort of replicate what you did there? Well, well that's a great uh, uh, a great question. The um, just a little bit of background. So again, originally, you know, this was a gatehouse project and then it became my business. Uh, we had uh, sales reps that came to town from gatehouse and, and from that they sold three advertisers over the first eight months. When this became my business, I had enough money in the bank to survive for three months. And I had, I figured I needed a, at least 40 advertisers at an average of $100 a month to meet basic necessities. Uh, so we'd have paid for a year in advance on the apartment we were renting. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to pay utilities or food or anything without getting to four thousand dollars a month, pay our medical bills, uh, so insurance, I should say. And so uh, that was kind of the goal. I first went around. I took media kits to every business, and I want to come back to why that was important. Then I started calling and asking for appointments. I found if I can get an appointment, I got to the point where I was getting like an 80% close rate. So that was kind of the process. Why this, um, those media kits and those initial visits was important is we pretty quickly got up from that in that period to 2,400 visitors a day, which was nowhere near like 100% coverage of this community. Not even like, you know, I mean, it's a fraction, right? But I started hearing all the time, everybody reads the Batavian. Everybody reads the Batavian. Well, everybody is all the connected people that always talk to each other. Most of them are small business owners. So handing out that media kit was a tremendously important um, marketing device just to get readership. And so and let's, let's, readership. Let's, let's talk about that because you, you, you said when you sat down with an advertiser and you started talking about the way this advertising works and CPMs, the famous the eyes glazed over mm -hmm. and so what does a successful media kit look like uh i you know i don't know i don't have the magic formula i've never been 100 percent satisfied with my media kits i think it just needs to introduce i mean uh you know introduce your especially if you're a new website introduce the website to the small business owner to the community here's what we offer here's why we're doing it uh you know you got to include something on traffic what what your ad offerings are, what the ad rates are, you know. So uh, they basically start to um, uh, get introduced to you. I don't believe any media kit's ever going to sell an ad for you. Yeah, it's 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 got to be that that emotional connection sure. that you make, and I think you nailed it during the appointment. Mm -hmm. I think you can email all day long and get people interested, but I think getting that appointment and then going in and and again, what you said, they're buying you. Right. Mm -hmm. That's that's sales 101. Uh, you know, a, a very smart person once told me that 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 people hate to be sold to, but they love to buy. 
I mean, look at every and so that and so when they're buying, they 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 want to like you, they want to love you, and and so that that makes a lot of sense to me that you were able to eighty percent closure rate on that. So so at, at this point, um, how many advertisers do you have on your site? Um, I believe we're at about uh, uh, one thirty, one forty, somewhere around there. And then obviously we've been talking about display ads, uh, but I but I see that you also do some sponsored posts. I see you have deals of the day. Talk to me about um, some of the other differentiation or some of the uh, advertising products that you sell. And at what point did you start diversifying your your offerings? So initially we just had display ads. I built them myself, hard coded into the website, and then. Uh, but but as we got more ads, you know, the, you see how the ads get pushed down the page, and that became an increasing problem. I had to go in every day and and shuffle the ads so that ads that were at the bottom got to the top. Everybody got some time at the top. We had no premium ad positions yet, and then uh, we wanted to start adding pre premium positions and and then introduce rotation at that point so we could have more advertisers in more premium positions, and. Uh, and I should mention we we limit to all our uh, premium positions to share being shared by only three or four advertisers, just because we want to make sure every advertiser, you shouldn't have to lo load more than a couple of times to see your ad. I don't want that. I loaded ten times and didn't see my ad. That should never happen, right? Um, so, uh, so that's when we had to start. That's when we had to get an ad server. Originally started with OpenX. That got hacked. That was a nightmare. A bunch of our users got malware. And uh, so I got off the open source stuff and Ken, uh, Kenny from Broad Street saved us and had us up on his platform in three days, fully functional. And that's where we've been ever since. So so, so your display ads, they they all shuffle uh, in position at the, through Broad Street? So yes, Broad Street uh, supports us. So we have our premium positions where it's all, all basically fixed, but each slot is in rotation with other advertisers. So three or four advertisers in a slot. And then the ads on the left-hand side the, and right-hand side of the page uh, with each page load shuffle. I like what you do in terms of sponsored posts because I, I, I and, and really uh, your news content too. I mean, I love the way that you will just paste a press release on your site. I mean, I, that's, I mean, to me, that is providing instant information to people who, like you said, want, want to know what is new since the last time I visited here. And, and to me, that's a no brainer way of doing it. I, so w when you, but on the sponsored side of things, I see that you, you, you have just about a sponsored post a day. Um, you know, how, how did these, did, did it take a while for you to, to sell these? Did it become a, uh, and, and become a while for these to become popular? Did this was a word of mouth thing? Hey, if I send this to Howard, you know, you can put it on the site where everybody can read it and, you know, you pay him a couple bucks and Hey, you're golden. I mean, dump, how, how did that evolve? Well, uh, so I should mention our, uh, creative, uh, director, manager, Elisa Ace, who uh, her primary job uh, is designing and building ads, but we also, she has, she's has, she's my secret weapon, great customer, um, customer relation skills. So I do have her doing selling uh, some outbound calls, but mainly it's just, you know, those people that call in with questions, those small businesses that call in with questions uh, and upselling them, developing relationships with our existing advertisers and recognizing when, hey, they can use a sponsored post. Um, one of our breakthroughs with sponsored post was a local real estate agent um, who found that they were great for promoting open houses. So she run, still runs eight, 10, 12 sponsored posts a month. Um, not all for open houses now. She does, it's her primary way of advertising at this point. In, in all media, it's her primary way of advertising. Uh, so then other real estate agents start noticing that and calling in wanting their own sponsored posts. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then we really concentrate on sponsored posts when we know events, uh, organizations of events coming up and we know they advertise and have money. That's where the outball, out, you know, usually that's handled through email. And just yeah, so that's an outbound. Hey, we see that you have this event on your calendar. Mm -hmm. You know, expand your reach by doing a sponsored post with us. So um, we, and I just want to mention we limit it to two a day. So okay, 
Okay. Is that because that you got complaints about them and saying, Oh, this isn't news or is it, you just want to make it, uh, you know, the limited special unique for the, advertising? Yeah, I, I mean, the content well is about news. It's not about advertising. And so I, I kind of want to maintain that. I really don't like it happens uh, these days. I really don't like sponsored to post uh, stacked on top of each other. I like to have some news in between. Um, I, I worry that if there's two sponsored posts right at the top of the page, people aren't going to scroll down. Um, so that's kind of why that's uh, sort of my thinking. Nobody has ever complained for, either from readers or advertisers. So, yeah, it, it, you know, it seems to me that, that people, again, going back to what you said, people just want to know what's new. They just want to see what's happening where they live. And I don't think they really care if it's a written in a Pulitzer prize winning article format, or if it's just a copy and pasted press release on the page. I think people come to you because they want the news. I, I would love to talk about press releases for a minute because it's kind of a controversial subject around, around among journalists, right? I mean, there are journalists that think, you know, it's an abrogation of duty to just run a press release uh, verbatim. But most of the press releases that we run verbatim, there are, there will, are uh, exceptions that I'll address, but most of them are just their community stuff it's community news it's what's events are going on it's somebody getting promoted at a job a new hire at a local business you know uh, like when their banks hire a new bank manager you know that's a press release uh it's not stuff that necessarily needs uh all that journalistic time and attention it would be nice if i had an unlimited army of reporters we'd cover everything right but we don't have that and to me the most important thing is make make the community aware of what's going on. And I find readers really appreciate it. They feel like we have more news than our competitor because we publish every press release. I'm told and our competitor actually charges for press releases. We don't do that. So you publish every press release if it's community I, if, related. If it's local, if it's local, it's related. If it's not absolutely marketing, you know, it's got that marketing language in it. Um, politics, we've gotten a little more selective on on this day and age. Um, politicians are much bolder about, you know, outright deception and misinformation. And I don't have time to fact check that. So um, we're more selective on the political press releases than what we used to be. Yeah. So, so, um, you know, and, and then where in your mind, where is that fine line between this is a press release or this should be a sponsored post? What's the I, trigger? I, 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 you know, when you see it sort of thing, you know, um, you just recognize the marketing language. Um, I, you know, the obvious example would be, uh, you know, we're having a 10% off sale on Thursday, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's purely marketing. That's like such a simplistic answer, but I mean, that's kind of what you're looking for. Is this yeah. more about just promoting your business? I'll, I'll tell you, uh, let's see, uh, tops, uh, they're kind of, um, they irritate the hell out of me because they send us all kinds of press releases, but won't even give us one phone call with their marketing department. Um, and then sometimes they'll send press releases about, you know, every uh, uh, November 11th, it's Veterans Discount Day. Well, we'll run that press release. It's good community news. But Tops then they is run a, a store? Is it a, is it a business? Market. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. a chain. It's a chain. And then, uh, but then, you know, we'll get their press releases about our Monopoly contest starts next week. That's marketing. You know, if you yeah. want that on my webpage, buy a sponsored post. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, and your sponsor content, um, you, you mentioned real estate agents. Do you do you particularly think that it works better for for other, some types of businesses over others? Well, uh, so a lot of uh, one thing I want to mention: a lot of uh, news sites do sponsored posts as, as content. You know, they'll write a story or have a freelance write a story or something. Um, I, I've always felt I don't have time for that. I don't have the staff for that. I applaud those that do it. I think it's a great way to do a sponsored post. Um, we do have um, our big casino in town, Batavia Downs. They hired their own writer to write their own sponsored post along those lines. Um, so we do have that uh, sometimes. But basically, Lisa builds a graphic. And the sponsored post works best if you're doing an event or you have complex information. Like uh, before times got tough, we had a... Uh, uh, large law firm that specializes in workers' compensation. So they did had a regular rotation of sponsored posts that would explain various issues with workers' compensation. Um, so, uh, you know, it, inf information or special events. And on the real estate side, open houses are great. 
but so too you've got that new listing that you know you want people to look at all the pictures so you you put a couple of pictures in your sponsored post a little bit of why it's great have a description below that uh, has a link to the listing and uh, I look at every one of those. I bet you a lot of people do. Talking about chat GPT now and AI and automation, I didn't know what the hell to do with it until Kenny at Broad Street did this whole video about, um, actually, even after he did, he did an hour long presentation, uh, about an hour and 20 minutes about AI. And I watched it and I was like, okay, that's, that's neat. I don't really even know where he, I mean, even after an hour and 20, I don't know where to begin. But then he did another follow-up video and said, you know what? I called an advertiser and I asked him three questions and I recorded the conversation much like you and I are doing right now for this podcast. And then I, I ran the, the, the transcription of the conversation through chat GPT and boom, I got three sponsored posts. The, you know, each, each, each one of the questions I turned the answers into sponsored posts and I got three pieces of content. So when it, when it comes to sponsor content using AI, what's your thought on it? Uh, that's an interesting use case. Um, the um, I don't know. I, anytime I ask Chat GPT to turn anything out, I, it's horrible writing. But uh, the uh, I mean, it clearly sounds mechanical to me. But um, the I, you know it, I, I've looked at that kind of automation. Even on the news side, you know, we've got, uh, I think, a publisher in the den, right, who's come up with their own AI. And based on what I've seen, you know, it looks like it turns out decent news stories. You know, take a send a video and, and you get a news story out of it. That's been tempting to try. But then again, I'm so busy. I'm like, do I have time to even manage that? I mean, it saves yeah. me the time of writing the story, but you still there's you still got to track down the video. Then you got to, you know fact check it you can't just publish it you've got to like you know i want to have confidence that the, it's reported everything correctly out of that meeting how do i do that without right, one, right. watching the whole video anyway uh i want to switch gears and and talk about content and and, and what it takes to build a, a website that you just have to go to throughout the day you know over the years we've seen so many different things the pivot to video the rise of social you know, 10, 10, 15 years ago, websites, people would bookmark and then go to and, and check, you know, and, and today that would be translated to leave a tab open in your browser to go back to it and see what's new. So, so I, how, how do you build a news website that, that people become addicted to in 2024, where these, all these different mediums and social networks and, you know, the, it's always the shiny new thing. You, well, you you uh, you ruined the question and made it much harder to answer by asking in 2024. I don't know. You know, we started the Batavian at a time when Facebook was hardly a thing. I think it was actually still campus only for the first few months that we even existed. Pages didn't exist yet. You couldn't, if you had a business, you couldn't do anything special. You couldn't publish news on um, on Facebook. So it was a very and people, there weren't as many users. People weren't addicted. It was a very different atmosphere so i'll tell you what worked really well for us whether it would work in 2024 i think so but i can't say for sure i'd have to see somebody try it to the execution level that we did so um so what we did one of the things we did was uh, i was a big believer early on in real-time news and there are two approaches to that. I drive around the community a lot. What's going on? Take a picture of some construction or, uh, you know, some kids drawing chalk, uh, chalk art on the sidewalk. Anything, what's going on in the community right now? And then also uh, listening to the scanner. Um, uh, my wife at the time and I, we had a couple scanners in the house. She carried hers around in a basket with her wherever she went in the house. And uh, pretty much every call of a minimal amount of interest we posted. So we'd have sometimes three or four or five, six scanner calls in a day. Um, we became really good if there's a big breaking news event of um, giving consistent, constant updates. Uh, in fact, probably I mentioned before that we were at 2,400 users a day. We went up to seven or 8,000 users a day in, um, on one event. 
there had been a bank robbery in one of the small communities in our county, Elba. And this was in June 20, 2009. We had just moved here. I'd personally owned the site three or four months. And uh, I went out there with my laptop, totally ill-prepared for spending all day at a crime scene. There was a manhunt going on. And the most important thing that happened, and keep in mind, my competitor didn't have a website yet. Facebook was hardly an issue. And uh, so we were the only source of news in the whole entire county. And the, and the um, school system did us a huge favor. They put every school in the county on lockdown. Mm -hmm. So parents wanted to know what's going on. And a huge number of people in the community learned about the Batavians for the first time on that day. Uh, and, and then our traffic never went down after that. Yeah, Scott Broadbeck at ARL Now in, um, in Washington, D.C. area talks about having that mix of content. You, know, you have breaking news, fires, police chases, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. You have local government. Uh, I know he does a lot of restaurant coverage. I mean, he, he's in an urban area where there's a lot of new, you know, mom and pop restaurant, you know, cafes and mm -hmm. things opening up and closing. And, and so, you know, so you, you said you had four or five breaking news pieces, you know, from the scanner a day. Do you still do that? Has your mix changed? Do you, what's your mix? Uh, so, uh, yeah, so about three years ago, uh, my wife passed. So which you may be aware of. And so without her to help listen to the scanner all the time, uh, it's been much harder. I have, and frankly, kind of knowing that we're going to miss stuff. I have a much more lackadaisical attitude about it. And I just don't post everything off the scanner anymore. Um, we missed, I, I had to turn the scanner off the other night. And so I missed a big call yesterday morning just because it just wasn't top of mind to have the scanner on. And um, so there was a big uh, truck accident in one of our communities yesterday. Uh, and uh, only our Facebook competitor had any information on that. Uh, so that's changed a lot. We still do a lot of press releases. Um, we battle constantly against Facebook. A lot more, we see a lot more organizations not sending press releases and just posting stuff to Facebook. Uh, we did a whole social, a whole uh, house ad campaign using uh, memes to uh, fight back against that. Mm -hmm. uh, I How'd that work? Hard to say. I mean like it seemed like for a week or two afterwards we started getting more press releases and then over the last week or two it seems like everything's gone back to normal so yeah. where we're seeing do you get a lot of tips do you get a lot of emails and photos from people who are you know out on the scene of something or you know just hey what's this i saw it i took a picture i'd like to know more not as not not as much as what uh we used to i you know one thing that i think might be unique for us for, than for a lot of other communities i don't know but one of the ways that Facebook has hurt us is by enabling somebody to publish for free, no overhead, no worry about revenue. And there's a woman in town who's a freelance videographer for the new news stations in Rochester and Buffalo. And she started a Facebook page. She posts stuff off the scanner. It's so easy for people to send her stuff through Messenger. Um, and all of, almost all of her audience is entirely on Facebook which is just such an easy platform people to access and for her to post it's a huge uh, competitive problem for us so um we don't get we still get news tips um but i see stuff you know, and readers will still sometimes send us their user photos but uh it pales in comparison to what she gets in you know, tips and meons. you know there's always been this, this uh thing amongst lions about you know own your data uh, you start your own website, you know, don't put everything you have on uh, another platform like Facebook or Twitter or what have you, because at the end of the day, you don't own it and it could be gone tomorrow. So, um, but, but knowing that and, and knowing what you've been through since you started your website, you know, if you were starting it today, what would you do differently? Well, there's no money to be made on Facebook. The only thing you can do is if you want to make money, it's, you got it on the platform. You've got, that's where you're going to put all your ads. Um, we now have a pay model. The one thing I do differently is start, start with pay right away. Um, I, I should mention how we do subscriptions. It's limited. It's a limited number of stories, byline stories only, original reporting only, essentially. 
uh, the more substantial stories and uh, the paywall, I hate calling it a paywall, but it's only up for four hours. After the four hours, the story becomes free. So, and we're up to like 270 uh, members. We call it early access pass. So I had, I tried, had tried membership models uh, early on. I wish I'd stuck with them, but you've got to have a mix of revenue. Um, I, you know, I wonder in today's environment for if, if a new publisher followed exactly our model, is it the environment's just too tough or is that still like the magic formula? I don't know. I think what your site is, and I think a lot of the, the successful sites, you know, whether they're, you know, whether they're very clean and have a few ads or whether they're like yours and are just completely a reflection, I would say, of the business community, I think they're authentically local. And I know at one point there was this thing 12 years, 10, 12 years ago, there was a, this it was a thing authentically local. And, and I'm not at the sure bottom of our homepage. We still run the authentically local uh, logo. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so, but I, but I think, you know, it, that it being a thing aside, I mean, it's, it's kind of what you are. Mm -hmm. And I think people get that. And I think that when they come to a local news website, you know, I don't think they're expecting the flash and pizzazz of, you know, a, a, of a big time news, the New York times or Washington post or financial times type of website. Uh, you know, I, I think the fact that, you know, you publish your photos, you post photos, you know, in, in ascending order in a, in a Facebook post, I'm sorry, in, in a, in a blog post in a WordPress post, I don't know if you use WordPress, but Drupal, on Drupal. your site, um, instead of in a, in a nice, pretty slideshow container, uh, I, I think it gives it that authentically local feel. First of all, we get a lot of compliments on, you know, so our competition, our newspaper competition uses what I call the traditional newspaper website headlines and links. And uh, which I think is a failed model and newspapers should abandon it and do what we do. But because I get feedback all the time, your site's so much easier to read. It's so much easier to find the news. You know, they don't know usability. They don't know how to articulate that. They just know it's easier to use. And also we get a lot of feedback. I love all the, you know, that all the ads are right there. It's kind of like a local business directory, which was totally my intention. That's the feedback we get. So, um, uh, you know, I just think it's a, the, the easy use thing. Uh, is big, I, you know, local ownership. I, how important is that? I don't know. I, I've always wanted to find a chain willing to experiment with our way of doing things and see how they do, you know, um, just to see, is it the model or is it, is it there, uh, something magic about being a local owner that's engaged in the community? Um, I think that's a, a kind of a fair point to debate. Yeah. I, I remember going to, to, it was before line, it was block by block mm -hmm. in 20. 12, I think 2011, 2012. And, and one of the, um, you know, being a, a relatively, so I started my site in 2010. So the, so is, this is very new and I was, you know, very excited and very happy that I was actually doing what I wanted to do. I was my own boss. I love what I do. Um, and going to Chicago to block by block. And one of the seminars is like, what's your exit strategy? How do you plan to get out of this? And it's like, I don't know. I, I, I just got into this. I love what I do, but now I'm 14 years in and, 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 and you're, you're, you're longer than I have uh, doing what you're doing. Uh, is, is there an exit strategy for you? You talk about, you know, wanting to you know see if your model would work somewhere else. Would you, would you think you would sell your, your business and move on to something different? Uh, when I know when I'm out of this, I'm done with the news business. Um, that's for sure. I really want to, you know, kind of dedicate the rest of my life to music. Um, the, uh, if, you know, frankly, I, you know, we're going to end on a down note if that's the last question, because uh, as much as I love this business, as much as I want to encourage young uh, young people, especially to take it up, it is doable. It can be done. Um, doing it solo with bootstrap is very difficult. And, uh, you know, it's become more difficult as I've gotten older with, you know, all the, we've collectively all been through a lot of shit that it's taken its toll on all of us, I think. Um, and then I've had my own, you know, personal issues, uh, personal tragedies and whatnot, kind of all the additional things that I have to take care of my life now, take care of my life alone now is a lot more strain. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, 
it's all just a lot harder than it used to be. So, um, I, you know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of ready to get out if I could, that's probably still two or three years away at best. Um, I would like to, you know, put together enough money to hire a couple of reporters and show that the site can operate great without my daily involvement, or at least, you know, I can be part-time and still have the site be successful. Um, and then I think it becomes something that I can sell. If we get to the point where I just have had enough and want to go and there's no buyer, that's going to be a really hard decision because the community depends on us so much. And yeah. we're so important to the community. You know, I, honestly, I think that you know, there's a lot of people who are argue, especially on the national press and the, the, the and corporate media. Uh, there's a, the, the trust in the national press has never been lower than it is right now. But I think that on the local side, it's much different. I think that people truly cross the local media and, and by extension, the people that bring it to them. And I think that if, if the print folks and, and, and by extension online could take a page out of TV, uh, TV has always been about branding and image and faces and, and people you like to invite into your living room every morning or every evening to, to hang out with essentially to get the news. And whereas the, the print idea has always been like, well, we're, we are the news, right? It's we're first. I mean, the, the TV people rely on us. We wouldn't have anything to, to talk about if we didn't write it first. But I think that what we're seeing here is a realignment of the way people get their news and who they get it from. And I think that it's, it's more akin now to going into the bar and talking to the people whom you know and saying, hey, what'd you hear? What do you know? What do you think? And they'll and the bar being that website or that yeah. Twitter account or that email newsletter that that they sign up for. Um, and they and they will extend their trust to that particular publication, video, whatever it is. Uh, and, and 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 so I think that if I if I were doing this uh, uh, starting from scratch, you know, I may I may not call my site Potomac Local uh, because we're on the Potomac River near Washington D.C. in Virginia. You know, I may call it you know Uriah Kaiser Reports or you know something to that effect um, to brand. I, I may put my picture on it and and try to say, hey, this is you know this is but but back. Back then in 2010, you know, the dream was, hey, I'm going to start this. People are going to come. It's I'm good. It's going to grow. I'm going to have a room full of reporters at desks and I'm going to have salespeople that are going to go out and you know do all the thing. I, I worked in sales and 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 on the news side, I made more money selling ads for newspapers and, and TV than I ever did, you know, chasing fire trucks for newspaper and TV. But what's more fun? Chasing fire trucks for anybody is more fun than selling ads uh, i just i want to you know make kind of a, i guess kind of a sales pitch to the the pe people that might consider doing this after my little bit of a downer talk is um the uh people are are very hungry for local news i use well first of all, i want to back up just a little bit you know nearly 20 years ago i had a uh a, a, a talk i used to do i did american press institute i think i did it at uh society of professional journalist and I call it, it was kind of campfire media. And I'd talk about, you know, the future of media isn't brands per se, it's personalities. And we all used to sit around the campfire telling stories. And that's what we're going back to, right? Um, so, and the other thing I can talk about is, you know, local, lo local news is the DNA of a community. It's what ties everything together. Um, and so, and there's a professor friend of mine who years ago used to talk about local news is dead. He kind of tried to discourage me from, you know, taking this path. And I think the success of the Tavian proves him wrong. Uh, you know, never in my career till I did this, did I have people drive, I'm out mowing my lawn in front of my house and a guy drives by in a pickup truck and says, Howard, you're a rock star. You know, and I walking out to an accident one day and the traffic's all backed up and, People are yelling out, we love the Batavian, you know, they're parked in their cars, you know, stuck in a traffic jam and they're yelling out greetings like that. Went, uh, had a, a couple of uh, a mother and her daughter run up to me at a, at a pancake 
breakfast one time. You know, we love the Batavian. I just never got that kind of rock star treatment anywhere else. People love local news and they appreciate the people who do it. So number one is if you love your community and you're a journalist, you should be doing local news. If um, if you believe in the the mission of uh, news and it's important to, to community and holding uh, leaders accountable and uncovering stuff and just making people sure people are informed so that they stay engaged in their community. You should be doing local news. Um, for me personally, I think if you're the kind of person that believes in your community, you should also believe in your local businesses and want to support them and provide an avenue for them to be successful. That's where the advertising comes in. And that's advertising is about making money, but it's also about helping your local business community. Um, and um, the, you know, it's just an incredibly important mission. Um, I think somebody who's younger can approach this with um, more energy for a lot longer, uh, you know, because I was already, uh, what, well into my, uh, uh, well, about 50, I guess, when we started this, so kind of late. Um, so I just think that there's tremendous opportunities. You can make fine living. The other thing I wanted to mention, if you've ever uh, chafed at an editor telling you you can't do that story, now you can do that story. It's your business. Um, you're, you, you're a photojournalist. You know, I taught myself photojournalism. There's a particular kind of story you want to pursue or a particular pub picture you want to publish. It's your business. You know, you can do it. You have that freedom now. You have a kind of freedom that, as a young reporter, I always wanted and and I enjoy. And also, I think telling people stuff first is still uh, uh, an exciting process about news. So, um, and it's a way to make sure you have a journalism news career because uh, you can't count on employers. Yes, this is hard, but it's hard working for somebody else too. And you can't, uh, you know, you can't. No matter how much how good you think your company is you can't always trust it to uh, protect your job. Things have changed. Yeah. And, and I think it's, it's guys like you who've paved the way for a lot of independent publishers who have taken a look at what you've done, heard you talk, heard conversations like this that you've been a part of. And uh, I think you've proven to a lot of people that you can be a rock star at what you do so thank you howard for this conversation hey thanks for asking it uriah i really appreciate it and uh keep rocking where you are too